Welcome to episode 277 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm all right, Rob. How are you doing? Doing okay. Uh, have some issues with our, our cats. They're both at the vet right now because they've been eating parts of our tree, our Christmas mm. tree, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Mm, Hopefully they'll both be okay, true. though. <laughs> any Any news with you? Uh, n- nothing nearly that exciting, no. Um, <laughs> just finally at a quiet point of year, uh, so hoping to relax. Well, not relax, I'll still be working, but, you know, maybe not feel rushed for the end of the year. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, well, at the top of every episode, I'd like to hear a piece of feedback. Uh, last week we had Robert Leahy on the show, and we're talking all about networking TS, so we got a couple comments on Reddit. Uh, this one was from Zaxxon, and uh, he's saying, I wish the C++ language would focus on things that cannot be done based on the limitations of the languages instead of looking at things which have perfectly good implementations on all necessary platforms like graphics, networking. Um, but he's saying you know, something like static reflection is not true language features that enable new constructs should be what is added to the language. Everything else can go into Boost or some other Boost-like library. And uh, while there may be different people focusing on different parts of the language, I can't imagine that there's not some overlap and stress coming from core language people thinking about feature additions. Uh, you know, and, and we can talk to our guest in a moment about his thoughts on this, but there are completely separate working groups working on library versus core language features. So I, I don't think this is a huge concern. I think they, they can walk and chew gum and, and do both library <laughs> additions and, and core language additions. <laughs> there are friction points always. There are different wording considerations always. It's always somebody else's fault. And everyone wants to do good. What can I say? <laughs> it, it has nothing to do with people being nice or not nice. There, there, there's like clashing concerns. It's bound to happen. And sometimes you want core to do something for you that they won't do. And sometimes you hope that library will fix a trait or something and they won't do it. Sometimes the same words mean something different in both places. It's a big standard. Do you have any particular uh, thoughts or comments on something like networking uh, being standardized, though, Patrice? Uh, I, I've been on CVP chat in a debate on that topic two years oh a few years ago I, I, was, I was it was more than three years ago I, I i my point is always the same i want standardized networking because i'm so tired of using the c api and doing reinterpret casts and <sighs> fiddling <laughs> but 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 i understand the points uh, with respect to those who think it's too big or that will mess it up because it's complex and uh, I, i'd go for the simple api that covers the basics really and I know there's there's a push for security uh, uh, layer to the API to be added, mm-hmm. and there's conflicts with respect to that. But if I had at least the basics, that would let me move away from the platform headers, I'd be so happy. Yeah. How many times have I written it? I don't know you, but I've rewritten that API like 20 times in my life already, so I'm I'm a bit tired. I'm hoping for a standardized one. I've done, I've used either some libcurl wrapper or uh, Qt or Boost Asio since probably, say, 2005. It was only before that that I would bother going down to the C APIs, and after that I used whatever library had already been pulled into the system. But see, the, the, um, the trap there is when you're teaching, you cannot install APIs. You don't have the time to do that. The students, right. they don't mm-hmm. have the time to do that. So you need to go with what's already there. So when you're stuck there, you're using the Unix or the Windows platform API to work. Unless, unless you can include something that's standard C++, and then you're done. But I cannot make students install Boost. I don't have the time to do that. So, but it gives me an excuse to show unions and talk about reinterpret cast and alignment. <laughs> Yeah. All, all of this is undefined behavior. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. So hi there. <laughs> and I have a cat that bites its tail all the time and it has this cone around its head right now because it's damaging itself. So cat. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, quickly, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Uh, and joining us today is Patrice Rowe. 
Patrice has been playing with C++ either professionally for pleasure or for work for over 30 years. After a few years of doing R&D and working on military flight simulators, he moved on to academics and has been teaching computer sciences since 1998. He's been involved more specifically in helping graduate students and professionals from the fields of real-time systems and game programming develop the skills they need to face today's challenges. The rapid evolution of C++ in recent years has made his job even more enjoyable. He's been a participating member in the ISO committee since late 2014 and has been involved with the ISO programming language vulnerabilities since 2015. He has five kids and his wife ensures their house is home to a continuously changing number of cats, dogs, and other animals. Patrice, welcome back. Hello. The number of cats is seven right now. It's a small number. That's what I was going to say. Current number. Seven cats, any dogs at the moment? Yeah, two dogs, three birds, and the hamster in the youngest one's bedroom. <laughs> Mm. There's got to be a partridge in a pear tree at somewhere at that point, I think. <laughs> we, we, we have parrots. We have two small parrots and a big one, but the big one's like a, it's like a, a raptor. You know in uh, Jurassic Park? It's oh, yes. It attacks you. It's a very dangerous bird. It's very sweet with those that know it, but it can remove your fingers very quickly. <laughs> so are you the one of the ones that it likes or not? It depends on the day. <laughs> I tried I tried to give it water this morning and it attacked me so it has no water right now and my wife will fix that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I don't blame you. Yeah. My, my wife's good at this. Okay, well Patrice, we got a couple news articles to discuss. Uh feel free to comment on any of these and we'll start talking more about what you've been up to lately, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, so this first article is on uh, Jean-Hine Manid's blog, and this is a special kind of hell, Intimax T and C and C++. And we've talked about uh, ABI breakages, you know, fairly often over the past year or two. Yeah. Um, but this goes into the ABI breakage situation in C, which is apparently much, much worse. Than, well, uh, it's we C++. In C++, yeah, both. Yeah. But it's a very good article. It's very clear, I think. Jenny did a good job with this. It's a serious problem. It's hard to fix. It's, according to Jenny, it's unfixable in C, and that might just be the case with the principles that he has. It is very tough to fix in C++. What I liked is that he pointed out that we have the same problem, in a sense, with size T and other such uh, so, such types, and there it's... The aliases that we have are good, but they do they do bring problems in some cases. And Fortran might have had the good idea to encode the, the of the integers in the types of the the names of the types in some cases. Yeah, it's it's not a bad idea, but yeah, that's what we have. So I, I recommend that article. Great work, well written, very clear. Yeah. I feel like there's at least a tiny bit of hope since in C++ at least in the APIs that we define, I mean, that are part of the C++ standard library, not part of the C standard library, we can use overloads, mm -hmm. and then that's encoded into the name mangling, where I never even considered this before. The fact that C doesn't have any name mangling is just, just amplifies this problem. Yeah. Well, you have macros, as he said. <laughs> <laughs> nice and handy. I, I'm I'm a fan of exposing your 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 uh, internal uh, names as 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 types in your classes, like uh, size type and, and value type. I, I'm okay with right. that because it lets client code evolve properly. But the, indeed, the way that these things like int max t are 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 used and defined, they bring a special kind of hell to us. Yeah, he, he wrote the right thing. Yeah. And I will just say, also for the record, I didn't even realize int max t was a thing. I thought I that I knew all the standard types, or type defs. Oh, no. It's one of the things that make people tremble when you go to standards meeting. Nobody wants to touch that's like volatile, or there's a few others like that that are just scary. Is there also an int min t for like a car type def, basically? Nope. No, because you cannot go lower than a byte. It's the upper bound that's a problem. Okay. Mm. Yeah. All right. Uh, next thing we have here is uh, a library. This is a new one from uh, Jonathan Mueller, and it is called Lexi, a parser com combinator library for C++17. Uh, and I didn't look too much into this, but uh, it looks like it's pretty powerful with being able to specify you know, uh, a new DSL. Uh, I, I didn't play with it because I just looked at it this morning, but 
Yeah, I like I like the uh, the the technique, the approach mm -hmm. is very nice. I, I'm looking forward to. So, sometimes you look at something and it's the idea that's important. When I looked at Atomic the first time, I like the syntax. Uh, I like the way it expressed the idea. That's pretty pretty powerful way of naming things. So when I looked at uh, Jonathan's uh, library this morning quickly, I like the ID, the approach. There's something inspiring there. So uh, thank you, Jonathan, for that. It's pretty cool. I haven't played with it, though, so I don't know how good it is in practice, but it's, it's inspiring work. Uh, for our listeners, if you want to get an idea for something that's pretty relatively complex, is he has an example JSON parser that is in the examples folder. And if you remove the test code, it's only 272 lines, which is a pretty terse, succinct JSON parser. Yeah. The, the, mind you, I've, I've seen one by Louis Dion at a meeting once that's, that was scary small. <laughs> so some people are very creative with JSON parsers. Yeah. Well, I've, I mean, I've also seen small ones, but to be fair, the small ones that I've seen weren't necessarily tested a, for compliance, and this one actually does claim to be at least fully compliant. So I don't know about Louise, of, of course, but yeah. The, 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 the separation between the rules thing and the way the values are being defined, there's really something cool. If I, I, I urge readers to, or listeners to take a look at it, if, if only for the form it takes, because it might give them ideas for their own APIs. Yeah. Okay, and then the last thing we have is uh, from JetBrains blog, and this is Sea Lion 2020.3, which is going to be their, their last release of Sea Lion for this year. And uh, a lot of new features that they're advertising in this blog post, um, core dump debugging, C test support, uh, MISRA guideline integration. So it looks like they, they put a lot in here for this final release. Jason, are you still using uh, Sea Lion as your IDE? I am. You know, it really actually is saving me a ton of time when it comes to working on large client projects because being able to quickly navigate around the code and stuff is just... And, you know, if you know anything about me, like, a year ago, I wouldn't have said that at all. I'm like, mm -hmm. them, who needs an IDE? But, uh, yeah. Anyhow. Uh, and it's funny because I actually upgraded to 2020.3 uh, before I started the current... Um, task that I'm working on and didn't even realize that I was now able to drag the little arrow around inside the debugger and just do, autom you know, moving forward and backward inside the debugging. Yeah, it's nice. I, I know that feature has been there in Visual Studio for a while, but it's nice to see it in the C-Lion ID as well now. Yeah. yeah. I haven't played with it much myself. <clears throat> I played with it like, uh, by, uh, on the surface a few years back. But I, I like the efforts that they're, they're doing. The, I hear a lot of people complaining about the debugging experience of their tools. So it be better debugging experience if it helps everyone. And the, the mm -hmm. way that the MISRA rules are being shown or I wouldn't say enforced in there, but recommended or suggested, whether you adhere to these rules or not is interesting. It's a nice way to present things. Yeah. And if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about what's new in C Lion 2020.3, it looks like there's a whole bunch of videos uh, from our friend of the show, Phil Nash. It looks like he's uh, showing off a lot of these new features in, in little videos. And he makes cool videos too, so you can just watch them for the fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so Patrice, uh, it's been a while since we had you on. Uh, I think one of the first things I wanted to ask about was the recent uh, virtual plenary, which I think you uh, attended, and, and asked how things went at the uh, virtual ISO plenary. It, it was actually quite interesting. Uh, I, 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 I don't think anyone knew how long or how short it would be. We had planned a few hours, and it, it took much less than what we had planned. There was almost nothing controversial. There are, normally, there are things that you people uh, care about a lot in plenary and call votes on, and there's a lot of discussions. And in this case, the only one was the suffix for uh, size t. That that mm -hmm. that kind of well, they, they were against, but there were some votes against, but it was a majority vote. And, and most most of the stuff really passed without problem. There wasn't anything really controversial. The the big thing was. Um, Discussing how code of, conduct, code of conduct is enforced and how we can make the community more, more inclusive, uh, how we deal with each other with all the online meetings all the time, because it's, it's harder to make humor, um, uh, snickering remarks, um, 
and it's harder to pass emotion through writing uh, when you're doing technical stuff, and it's easier to get uh, affected by what other people write. So, uh, and if we want to make the community and the uh, community the the community more inclusive, it's something we have to care about. So there was a presentation on that discussions. Um, Enforcing the code of conduct can be seen as, some, seen as something oppressive by some too. So the way we do things is important. We had a poll before the meeting. We discussed the results together, uh, the interpretation of the results also. So it's uh, it's important. You know, human beings caring for each other, uh, making sure that everyone can, can express themselves, uh, get heard, um, uh, what we can and cannot write in public. Yeah. So it was an interesting meeting on the human side of things because the technical side, there was nothing really controversial there. The yeah. Kudos, though, to Davis Herring, who wrote a huge paper in CORE that uh, expressed much more clearly how a number of things are being done, particularly if I remember the overload resolution rules, which are very complex. So Davis did a tremendous piece of work. And normally there's one of these plenaries at the end of each standards in-person standards meeting, right? Yep, there's one at the beginning where we okay. normally put uh, the rules for the week. But, uh, the, the whip plenaries work. So you get there at first, everyone's in the same room normally. Well, we were uh, uh, between 100 and 200 in the plenary, uh, virtual plenary, which is a big number, really. It was fun to see the faces of people and everything. Uh, so, yeah, there's one at the beginning of the meetings where we set the rules for the week, uh, discuss uh, room assignment, uh, remind people of the code of conduct. There's a number of administrative steps that we have to take, uh, the things that we have to vote to start the ball rolling. Uh, and then we plan the evening sessions because we normally have evening sessions on top of the day sessions. So there's um, a very strict adherence to timing to make sure that everyone can eat and drink and sleep. But there's evening sessions almost every every evening. And then we meet at the end for a plenary on Friday afternoon. We take votes. And then there's an administrative plenary on Saturday morning normally where we close some issues with... Uh, some what well, isolated votes that we had to take but the, the there's essentially two big meetings one at the beginning and one at the end so this one was kind of an end of the week meeting where we took votes based this time on the work that had been done in uh, the various telecons that we're having because there's telecons every day <laughs> uh, it's very hard to follow the hard there, there's so much work being done right now so is yeah. this the first closing plenary that you've had this year with all of the cancellation of the in-person meetings? Yeah, well, th no, there was Prague. Prague, uh, mm, and, right. but, but I couldn't go there for, for base money issues uh, because I, I, you know, it's, it, it, it costs a lot to move around. Prague isn't a costly city at all. It was a beautiful thing, but you, know, you have to finance the trip. Um, so, so, and the other ones had been, uh, had been uh, canceled indeed or, or moved to the future, let's say. <clears throat> So uh, we had one in Bulgaria, if I remember, and one in New York that were planned that will be done at a later time. Uh, so yeah, but there were a lot of virtual meetings. <laughs> well, you, you, you're, both, you're both smiling. When I say a lot, I mean a lot. I mean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you should see my email box. It's, it's crazy. But if I did every one of them, I would be in a meeting every day. But I'm already in a meeting every day at work. So. And that's one of the things we discussed. Now, there's meeting fatigue in people. People have day jobs. It's, uh, it's volunteer work, the committee. So at some point, there's just too many meetings. We have to find a way to get around that. On the other end, it makes uh, the language evolve and advance. And people do get work done. So it's, yeah, we just need to find the right equilibrium there. Yeah. Yeah, I fortunately do not end up in very many meetings due to the nature of my work, which I'm actually really thankful for. Um, but I have heard that from a lot of people about meeting fatigue, Zoom fatigue and stuff. And in fact, um, it's interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, it's interesting because with my meetup, I have had uh, a lot of my normal regulars stop coming to my meetup because it's virtual and they're like, oh, you know, I'm uh, too busy or too tired of being on Zoom all day to come to another Zoom thing once a month. And I totally appreciate that. I'm not going to give them a hard time. But I've had an entirely different group of people who are from all around the country and in some cases around the world coming to my meetup 
uh, who don't seem to be suffering or, you know, whatever their tolerance level is for these things, they're taking advantage of the situation. Probably depends on what you do during the day. I mean, if you can do normal coding, that's cool. I, I give classes, so I'm always on Zoom these days, really. I, I'm on Zoom maybe uh, 7 to 12 hours per day. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 it, it, it's really significant. The, um, p, p, the the students that I have are tired. They, they're they're isolated. Even when they're living with their families, they're isolated. Uh, they they don't get to see other people much. Uh, they're always in their their bedroom or something. So they get uh, they're starting to suffer from depression, uh, anxiety. Anxiety was more at the beginning. Depression these days. Some of them are confiding the. the uh, uh, to tell me that they they are having hygiene issues, they don't wash anymore. They they are having sleep hygiene issues. They they don't mm. sleep much. Mm. They have trouble getting up in the morning because it's it's too hard. There's no routine left. So we're I'm trying to like make them work as a team, mm. talk to people and everything. So Zoom fatigue is not Zoom. It's it's isolation. It's the fact that you're not really talking to people anymore. And I, I think we can see now that we need to relate to people. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, since you brought it back around to school, how many classes Sorry. are you teaching right now? No, no, I was hoping that we would talk about that. How many classes are you teaching at the moment? Uh, two, two at the university, and I have three groups in college, two of them being uh, of the same, uh, same class and the other one something else. So, um, the third semester, fifth semester students, and then master degree students. One video game programming class. Uh, th this is actually funny, you like that. The, uh, the, the, that video game class, most of them come from France these days. I got a lot of French students. Brilliant back with me to study because in Montreal there's this big game development community there's a lot of work and a lot of jobs and so they want the vibe but they can't come from the vibe because they can't cross the border these days see we, we'll get we're gonna have them in winter there's like mechanics involved and but we'll get them they have quarantine and stuff and they'll all arrive during like early January but right now they're on France so I'm giving classes on Friday morning at French time so for me it's seven in the morning and, and, but okay. I had a few French uh, Quebec students. I had two at the beginning, one right now because one of them had to move around. So, so, so for some of them, it's very early. For the others, it's, it's in the afternoon. So they, they have to, but I've, I've never seen them in real life. I, I've been with them every week, but I know what some of them look like, and that's about it. Uh, most of my students in general, I don't even know what their face is because they are not forced to open their cameras. So I know, I know oh, their wow. names. Mm. But it's it's a very strange experience. So I'm trying to make it engaging and fun and make jokes, uh, trying to put some more time aside to speak to people and, and discuss their work and see what's going on in their screen. So sharing, uh, co-hosting co with them so that they can show me what they do. So giving them some personal time more than giving actual formal classes if I can because it's more human that way. It's less referable or less hurtful for them. So... I just have a hard time accepting like that you've been teaching a class a whole semester and not even know what someone's face looks like. I think at some point I would just or you as the instructor, <laughs> turn on your camera. No, <laughs> we, we, we can't. We, we can't force that because you have your, the right to control your own image. I, I, I'm trying sure. to get them to do that for the exam. Uh, I'm trying to make it fun. It's like let, let's make it cool, everyone. Just at least for one session, for one, one period, so that I can see your faces and know who I'm leaning with, and I can supervise better what they're doing if I do that too. But I cannot force them. I know, I know, professors don't want to show their faces because they want to control their public image too. So, but that's that's pretty weird because how it's it's difficult to get human contact if you don't see the person you're dealing with. Some courses are purely asynchronous, not mine. I give synchronous content all the time, but some professors, they write small YouTube-style capsules, like what you do with C++ Weekly or something, right. and they publish them. But that's that's you can learn through that, and that's fair. But it's a different way of teaching, and if you get only that in the semester, you have no contact with anyone. So you're completely isolated. So I'm just hoping that those who do that, the students see other teachers at least or other professors and can actually speak with them sometimes. So are these classes just like normal university classes? You meet for an hour, hour and a half, three days a week or something like that? Um, my, no, it's three hours in a row though. We were together for three hours in a row and we we, we, we actually do work. I mean, they, see my, they see my screen, uh, I write code with them, we discuss things. I, I do the same thing I do normally, but it's, it's normally I'm, I'm in the room with them, so I speak loud 
and I hit on tables. Right. And I, you know, and but I cannot speak loud because they have me in their ears right now. It's going to burst there. Go down, go down. I don't want to hurt them. I, I used to do that when I gave CVDCon talks, and I stopped because on YouTube people were complaining, my ears! So I don't do that anymore. <laughs> when I'm right. for that. Wow. I can tell you that when they come to Quebec, the, the French students in January, we're going to put them in a big room, like very tall ballroom style class, so that we can spread them out and they have mm. a lot of room and we can ventilate the place properly and take care of them. But yeah, I had one class in person during a semester. It was a very tiny master's degree class with two students. It was cool. So it was in person. I could actually go there physically and speak. Uh -oh. It was awesome. And after mid-semester, one of them hurt his back. So we had trouble walking. And the other one got COVID. So <laughs> he, he was delivering things for Amazon during the day and he got it somewhere. Oh. So, so yeah, so we moved to remote uh, classes for the second uh, part of the semester. Yeah. So if I understand right, some like UK is getting ready to roll out some vaccines next they week. They actually did. Someone got vaccine yesterday. Okay. Now, since you're involved in university and college curriculums and stuff, and uh, is there a discussion about what that looks like from a university perspective? Does anyone have a plan saying, okay, if we start getting vaccines rolled out, then we will do X? Or... Yeah. Well, we don't decide. It's uh, in Quebec, at least. It's it's a governmental matter, so the government gives the rules. Okay. Uh, uh, this uh, this fall uh, at Sherbrooke University, where I give my classes, uh, they had rented um, office space outside of the university to get more room and spread people more. So they had rented churches. Some okay. of the classes were given in churches because there's there's space there. You're right. Uh, and the they could maintain the actual in presence experience for I'd say two thirds of the semester. They had to stop at some point because there was an outbreak in the area there. And uh, my understanding is that the exams are being done in person too right now. So they moved back there even though they couldn't go there, but they're there now for exams. Uh, currently. Uh, in college, what we maintained was the classes that require presence. So when you need uh, nuclear uh, devices or things that could explode in your house, or when you're uh, putting needles in the arms of animals or people. Say, right? Right. So these things are done in person in smaller groups, and the other things are done remotely. So as you can imagine my classes are all remote. I don't put needles in anyone. Right. I, right. You could still ship nuclear reactors to your students, though. I, I could totally do that, I guess, but I don't. <laughs> but but we, do, we do have classes with robots and stuff, so these will require mm. some, some in-presence work uh, during the, the winter. Yeah. I find that a fascinating solution because, I mean, if you know anything about church buildings, at least ones that I would say are at least, at least 40 years old or more, they all have a giant open basement structure or something like that. They all do. And most of them aren't meeting in person these days, regardless of where you are. It, would, it is a giant area where you could have a few number of people with social guidelines and whatever. Yeah, you have to make sure they're, they're, they're far from one another. There was a, a wedding yesterday in Quebec with a specific religious community where there were 200 people in the same room. So the police had to go there and close the place. Not because they don't want the wedding to happen, of course, but because... You cannot have right now 200 people in the same enclosed space. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tricky. So university, we, we tend to have smaller groups. Uh, I can tell you that there's basic hygiene stuff, like you go to the bathroom while well, there's one urinal every two that's closed and one um, sink or every two that's closed. And you have to move around with a mask in your face. When you're sitting down in your office, you can remove it. So there's a number of rules like that. Right. Since you're talking about some of the, you know, difficulties with teaching over the past few months, have there been any positives, uh, any, you know, yeah. things yeah, you found are. that have been nice with teaching this way? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm, well, I, I, I use less gas. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm quite late on my podcasts. I am normally, I'm, I'm pretty much up to date with CPPcast, among others. And now in the, at least five podcasts that I listen to, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm like, 20 episodes late or something. Uh, what's what's nice? The, the tools are holding up. That's that's my my biggest surprise. Me not surprise might not be the right word, but it's it's cool that Zoom Teams and stuff they've all held up. 
uh, there have been almost no failures in the last nine months or so for me. It's held up all the time when there's previous power failures or stuff, but most of the time it just works fine. Uh, sharing documents has proven to be uh, functional. Seeing students' screen works. Uh, they, it's those who are mature enough, they ask questions. That works too. Uh, the uh, Discord uh, rooms work. People, they, they trade ideas and stuff and they help each other. So, mm. yeah, we, we, can, we can make it work. It's not pleasant, but it works. I, I'm happy about that. Uh, the worst part is grading. So reading as, uh, the, the, the uh, assignments that they do, the papers, grading, that takes forever. That takes forever because, uh, like, like, what I mean forever, I mean like five times as much time as it normally does. And, and why is that? It's because you don't see them. So you cannot present something, just circle something in red and say, come speak with me and be face to face and explain things. You have to put things in words. So you have to bring context. You have to be careful because they're depressed on the other end. You don't see them. Right. So you don't know in what state they are, so you have to make sure that they will get the gist in a constructive manner. That really takes a lot of time. When you have a 54-person class, say, it takes like weeks and weeks and weeks on end just to grade one assignment, so I'm so late in my grading. Wow. Yeah. Do, do you use at all any of these um, automated grading systems where the student you know, uploads the program, and if it gets the correct output, then they pass or fail, that kind of thing? No, no, I'm against okay. that. Well, it, 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 it's fine for one part of the job, but it's, it doesn't tell you if they wrote actually good code. Right. So, so yeah, I, I was... the thing. What, what I will do, I will try to do self-correcting exams for the execution part of things. So I, I'll make sure that if I, if I can, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that part of the, the, the work, like the execution part, I can, I can auto-grade or something. But I, I'll look at the code and that takes forever. Yeah, I, I was, it was like my, I don't know, second or third year in university when they started using automatic grading for the earlier classes. So I exactly missed that phase at my university. And when I saw that they were doing this, I was like, how, how does that work at all? Right? Like if as a student, it would feel completely demoralizing if it was pass or fail simply on whether or not it produced the right output. Because you could just, you know, write a program that did everything wrong or cheated or, you know depending on the nature of the project, uh, anyhow. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, uh, I, I think part of, my job is ge part of my job is giving feedback on the, the praxis, the practice of programming. So I, I, I look, I, I try to see if their code leaks. I look how they close their files. I look how they dispose their code, how they name things. So with, with, it's inspired some of my CVP uh, con talks this year, the, 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 the code that I saw and made me react. But, but I think it's important. I mean, it's okay that you don't do it every time because at some point it, it takes too much time. But you have, to, I, you have to do it at least, I think, at least once per semester to give them some written feedback as to how they do things. But still, so I self-impose that hell on myself. I like reading code. It's just a matter of time, really. Re reading code is important and it's fun. But when they're beginning, it's not always pleasant to the eye. See? <laughs> yeah. Well, since you mentioned uh, your CPPCon talk, uh, I think you gave two talks at CPPCon 2020 yeah, this two year? Th two talks in the class, yeah. Oh, okay. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, things that C++ does right talk? <laughs> um, I, I do a lot of C Sharp these days and a lot of JavaScript because hmm. uh, the college where I teach, they, they use these tools more than C++ uh, in the current years ago. The students will not learn as much. I, think, I hope they will continue to go to school for a little while after that, uh, just to give, uh, give a broader perspective on programming, because like managing resources might be something that they won't be as good as uh, as good at as they should be. Still, I see a number of things that other languages do, and I, I keep seeing people complaining about C++ all the time, saying, oh, this is so bad, not type safe, not memory safe, blah, 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 blah. Which of course there, there's there's bad things in every language. So so so, so but I, I do notice things that C does really really good in the way it. Uh, I know initialization is complicated, but there are things that we do right, 
And that's what I, I tried to put there. Uh, if you put a default value in a uh, member variable and then your constructor passes and does something else, there will be only one initialization, not two. If you do C sharp, you're going to get two initializations for the same variable if you do that. There's a number of interesting things that we do that are pretty cool. The fact that we have value semantics is awesome. <laughs> People underestimate the importance of local reasoning and value semantics. So uh, I tried to put these things, some of these things at least, because it's not an ex exhaustive list, it's a huge language and there's many languages out there, but I tried to put a list of these things that I noticed that we do right in, 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 in that talk. And it's funny because I also had another talk on things that we, we I, I called that uh, of void parent parent functions and other innocuous evils. So had this, this dark talk on things that are wrong and this bright talk saying things that are more right or that we do right. So I had these black slides and these white slides or such. So I tried to do something cute with it. I hope it worked. Yeah. It's funny because I gave that, that uh, things that Sibyl does right talk at the user group in Montreal a few weeks before. And kind of like you were saying, Jason, the regulars weren't all the same, but there were people from Toronto and Vancouver, so I could see uh, a number of friends that I see in conferences and, and committee meetings there. And so there was quite a, quite, quite a big audience, a lot of discussions afterwards. People reacted nicely to it. I was uh, um, pleasantly surprised. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, was that meetup held via Zoom? <laughs> Yep. Did the attendees keep their cameras on while you were talking? Uh, not all of them. I could see a few. A I few. could see if okay. the host was uh, in the names, of course. So, uh, but uh, actually in the chat room, so people were expressing themselves through writing, kind of like what they did in CVPCon. Okay. So it, it was kind of interactive. So uh, the, the uh, usual culprits were quite visible. But uh, those people that you see and talk more and ask more questions, but that's fine. And and yeah, no. It, again, the tools the tools delivered, I and mean, it worked fine. Right. I hope people liked it. I, I know that some people see, saw some of my code samples on YouTube after that and said, "Well, that's bad C sharp code." I know that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that C sharp is a bad language; it's that you can do that with it, and it's kind of weird. So you you, you have a string s equals mm -hmm. null, and then you add null, and you check its length, and it's zero, because you can, if you add null to a null string, you get an empty string. That's that's weird to me. That is weird, yeah. That's weird, but it passes. It's fine. Maybe, maybe it's good in some mindset, but I, I, I like my strings to be values. <laughs> so, so, yeah. There, value semantics are awesome. Like some of those JavaScript shenanigans where you can add a I don't know, a string and a number in one order and you get a number back, you add it in a oh, different yeah. order, you get a string back and that kind of but, thing. But, but, but we can craft that in C++ too because we, we're crafty people. But, That's but by true. Default, things. I, 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 I'm wary about that because at some point I made a joke on that on Twitter and, and Brendan, uh, I, I don't know if I pronounce his name, went back to me and said, hey, <laughs> <it's not laughs> really okay, I, I, I like JavaScript, don't worry, it was just a joke. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any other uh, specific examples that uh, you thought were worth mentioning from that talk about uh, things we do right in C++? Well, the, 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 right, the right part, um, the, 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 the big point really was uh, what made me write that talk was that I realized that we, we have a language <clears throat> that lets us be efficient. We don't have to fight against it to be efficient. Uh, in some other languages, you have to make effort to be efficient. The, the basic code that you will get, you will be required to write new everywhere. You will have to handle null values. Uh, initialization um, will be considered cheap because you're only uh, using references all the time, so they will tend to do more work than they should in many cases. Um, there's, there's things that we can write elegantly in C++ uh, if you understand how containers and iterators work that uh, are difficult to write in other languages, but they provide functions that do it for you. But uh, if you had to do it yourself, you'd be in trouble. So we have very good groundwork tools to build nice things from clean abstractions. If you learn the basics, you can do many things easily. You don't have to go through an API and look for the function that has already done it for you. 
Yep. So that's one of the things that I really like about C++, the expressiveness of it all. <clears throat> one of the examples that I had in my, my talk was a read all text or something. In C Sharp, if you want to read all the text from a file, you need a function that's, that, that does that for you. If you have to write it yourself, well, it's, it's involved. It's simple plus. It's simple plus. It's a one-liner because you can use a pair of iterators on your string and build a string from it, and you're done. And it's the same way you can copy containers. You don't need to have a two array or a two list to do it for you. Mm -hmm. You have constructors that do the job. It's a very uh, general solution to the problem. It works. It's efficient. It's clean. So uh, if you, but it's okay also to have a big library with a number of special case tools that work. That's that's not bad. But I appreciate it in C plus plus. That's not the way we went. Yeah, I, I like the myself, to build this. Yeah, sorry. That's that's all right. I always find myself frustrated when I'm in uh, JavaScript or Python or C sharp or whatever, and you're talking about value semantics, and I'm like. I, is this a copy or a reference? I don't know what's going on here because like if it's a struct or if it's a built-in type or if it's a class, then it changes meaning in different languages. And the yeah. fact that we have this consistency in C++, I think is a huge thing for me. Think about Lambda captures. <clears throat> so when, when, we do, when we write Lambdas, we express uh, uh, precisely what we want to capture and if it's by value or by reference. Right. Uh, if you're writing a Lambda in C Sharp, you write less code. But if you want to do something else than a reference to something, you need to use a variable in the enclosing scope, make a copy of it, and then use that copy inside your Lambda. Otherwise, you'd be referring to something you might not be looking for. So if you're doing a for loop that starts threads, and capture the index variable of your for loop, you're going to be in trouble in your Lambda because right. you're getting referenced by default. But if in your for loop you make a local copy of the thing, then you capture a local copy and it's a different variable for every iteration of the loop. It's not bad, but to me it's weird. So so I, I kind of appreciate that we can be clean, um, clearly express our IDs in C++ and there's no ambiguity in the code when you look at it. Right. And this thing about this is perfect at all. You know, it has lots of words, and that's fine. All languages do, but it's 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 reviled by some, and I think it's unfair. I think it's a beautiful language. Yeah. Well, before we were um, you know getting ready for the show today, you mentioned that you were working on uh, a set of requests for SG14, which is you know the committee or subgroup working on like game development and, and high performance features. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely, low latency group. The, yeah. the, um, I, I was approached by uh, one of the big uh, com game companies in Montreal in 2019 uh, because the, the, they said, well, it's, it's time that we tell the standards people what we want and what we need. So, and I really, really appreciate that of them. Uh, very cool people. I want to name them because I don't want, I want to get more games people involved. But they came with a list, uh, a written list. We went to a cafe, we chatted for about an hour, an hour and a half or something, and then we did a number of uh, ping pong emails to make the list more formal, clearer. And then I started going to other companies and I'm building this, um, this um, I have the French name in my, in my mind, I don't have the English name, sorry. But this list, let's say, uh, formally written of things that the companies would appreciate from the language. Uh, some library stuff, some, some core language stuff. I think it's a reasonable list. Uh, there's a number of things in there that will go in the direction that the language is already going. So I'm, I'm trying to prepare the, the presentation of this thing in such a way that I will get uh, maximum uh, support from first SG14 and then uh, the rest of the committee. I think it can be something that uh, will bring people together. It's a good list. Uh, there's, uh, astonishingly to me, a number of non-performance related things there. Things mm -hmm. about safety, uh, integer overflow, uh, mm -hmm. better compiler diagnostics, uh, because they do a lot of debugging. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so I have, uh, I'd say, around 30 requests right now that we'll try to categorize and bring to the SG14 in order to, uh, yeah, make C++ closer to what the low latency people need. So I'm hoping to do that early 2021, i say, because I have the list, I just have to put it together in such a way that I can present it. I met two big companies so far. Uh, we spent three to four hours in both both cases. 
And uh, yeah, I think it will appeal to a lot of people. So it, it, it's nice to see um, uh, niche, niche, big niche, but niche communities there trying to bring the language better, f- but in a way that will benefit everyone. Yeah. yeah. So that's Is there any, those, yeah. any standout interesting performance things or whatever that you would like to call attention to? Well, the 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 the, uh, the trend towards compile time programming continues. So, oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, uh, the the um, there are things that people like in C sharp that they would like C plus plus to do, uh, like compile time string formatting, uh, so SD format but context parallelized. I think we can do that really. Uh, so the uh, string interpolation that C sharp does, something like that, it would uh, I think benefit lots of people if we could find a way to make it work in C++ and we probably can. Yeah. So I can tell you about that. Um, they, 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 they get bitten by a number of math related problems. So they're, they're looking for better uh, overflow diagnostics or uh, UB detection behavior. So they, they, they like that a lot. In terms of performance, I, I, sh- I should have brought the list with me. I could have given you a more complete list. But the, let's say that <clears throat> since I don't want to commit myself in public Right now, before I speak yes. to S14, I won't go into details, right. and that will hide the fact that I'm not ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious that since you keep men- that you mentioned uh, signed integer overflow a couple of times or integer overflow a couple of times. I'm curious uh, if they ever or if they have the capability of testing their games with UBSAN enabled to see where it catches these things. If that's interesting to game developers. Yeah, 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 they could. But what I heard was uh, unsigned. Uh, the, some of them would like unsigned integer overflow to be considered UB with some compiler options in order to detect it better with such tools. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so some of them would like when, in some cases, they would like to be the, that to be considered uh, as UB to uh, detect it more easily. So that, that surprised me, but I heard it from two different companies. So there hmm. has to be a need for that somewhere. I, I, I have use cases that they, su- they suggested. So, yeah. Interesting. Just reminds me of watching your score counter, you know, flip over in an old game kind of thing, you know? Uh, it still happens. <laughs> It still happens, but but the, 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 these are real needs that come. Uh, as I said, uh, evidence about thirty. It's real needs from the ground. People who live with C plus plus day to day do things that are interesting with it, and say, well, the language could be better for us if you had this, this, this. Of course, there's always the exception related things because they don't like exceptions, right. but they they would probably like the herb exceptions. Uh, then they would like us to to push for them or something similar. So that that's that's clearly in the, um, the one of the things that they target but it's it's a long list okay look for look forward to that early 2021 when I get the chance to write it if they solve all of these problems and get the safety that they want there's going to be an entire category of twitch speedrunners who will be out of a job <laughs> yeah I, I'm sure they find something else to do yeah those are fun to watch. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to go over, say, Patrice, before we let you go? Oh, no. Uh, it, it is, it, what can I say? I, I miss listening <laughs> to CVG Cast. Uh, I, miss, I miss meeting the community people. Uh, I, I can tell you that one of the highlights of the last meeting to me was that Mr. Brown, Walter Brown, told us he would be retiring. Oh. So let me mention <clears throat> that uh, I have huge respect for the man. He's, uh, he's courteous, he's very nice, uh, mm-hmm. he's a bright mind, very uh, focused. Uh, his CPPCon talk this year to me was the best one we had. I, I haven't seen it on YouTube yet. It was a tremendous piece of work on... on <sighs> it was tied to how we, how, how we find names through ADL and other mechanisms. It was, it was, it was really awesome. And, and on the same... Um, in the same area, uh, let me say that I, I, I miss Mr. Dawes, who just died uh, last week, a lot too. He's someone I met at CVPCon. I had the pleasure of working with him uh, in a few meetings. He was retired for the last two years or so, and we will miss him. He had a keen mind. He was gracious to me, and I appreciate him very, uh, very much. So we're lucky. We're walking... And uh, we're working in a science that still has some of its giants, and uh, we're lucky to meet them, and we're lucky to uh, have the chance to benefit from their knowledge and skills. 
and when they go away, Mr. Brown is still very much alive, and I hope he will remain alive for a long time. But when, when they go, well, a part of us goes too. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was great having you on the show again today, Patrice. Thanks You're very nice. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, friends. Thanks for coming. Bye.